Hey guys, so another year has come to an end and that means another worst books of the year list. And you know something? The best books of the year list and the worst books of the year list, they're both very hard to do but for different reasons. For the best books of the year, oftentimes there's just so much that I love, but for worst there's just so little that I hate. And also, I have to say that it's kind of like I've bitten through quite a lot of clunkers and as a result, a lot of these seem better in comparison by quite a large margin. And also, you know something, I'm an author myself and I've been criticized for my work in the past. And if you are an author, um, maybe unlikely, an author who has written one of these books that's on this list, I'm sorry. I don't mean any offense and I don't mean to hurt your opinion. I know that sometimes authors can really get hurt by critics, but I hope you don't. And it's just my honest criticism about what I thought. And if you like any of these books, then that's terrific. I encourage you to go tell everyone why you like them and recommend it to as many people as possible. And also, if you think that one of these books that looks interesting to you, then I encourage you to read it and find out if you actually end up liking it. So without further ado, let's get another top 10 rolling. Or in this case, bottom 10 rolling. So starting off at number 10 is a, is a book that I really didn't want to be on here, and I do respect. It's The Art of Starving by Sam J. Miller, and here's the best thing it has going for it. It's about a kid with a really bad eating disorder, but he finds out that he has superpowers, and they can be heightened, like his sense of smell, his sense of sight, and even like mind control as long as his, as all the energy that usually goes to digesting food instead goes to these senses. And honestly, he has to do so many different things, go on so many different walks and just days of school. And the fact that he has a complete empty stomach made me just hungry while I was reading this book. It made my stomach hurt, made me, made me go for the chip bag and over to the fridge so many different times. I honestly don't know if I gained weight while reading this book or if I lost weight from all that food flushing out of my body from the idea of being hungry all over again. One of the problems I felt though was that the main character Matt was a little too techno wordy wizardry and also the end was very very anticlimactic there were some very positive notes in the end, and it's definitely unlike anything I've ever read, certainly. And I really like the way um, this Muslim gay teen is portrayed in it. But yeah, just um, there was so much more it could have done with this clever idea. And coming in at number nine is a book that came out ten years ago called Truancy by Isamu Fukui. I coincidentally found out about this while I was looking up the definition for truancy. I mean, like, I knew what the word was, but I just was curious about some history with it, so I looked it up on Wikipedia, and there was a link to the book called Truancy. So I got it, and I have to say that the first half was incredible. It really related to how I felt that some teachers were just out to get people. And you could really tell that Isamu Fukui was really trying to rebel against the school system that he had apparently been under. The problem is, it's like 430 pages that actually ends up like 600, how it feels like. And there are so many different fights and stabbings that I ended up losing count. It actually is the most pessimistic book I think I've ever read. And a funny thing is, with all of this pessimism, this is kind of book that even dares you not to recommend it. I guess it just ended up exhausting for me. And now coming in at number eight is a book called The Jewel by Amy Ewing. I decided to read this because I liked the selection trilogy. Well, it's now a selection quintet by Kira Cass, but I'd only read the first three and this looked like an interesting one. And also, I enjoyed the idea of forced pregnancy, and I also liked the powers generally, but it felt very just debut novel-ish, and I find it a little hard to believe that this guy would sacrifice everything, like every single thing for this girl he doesn't know completely well, especially since he's in big royalty. The romance was very typical, and that's what made me think it. Now, I thought the ending was great. It had the sort of ending that was sort of like in Golden Sun by Pierce Brown, where everything just all of a sudden with the snap of a finger turns to shreds. I just felt that for the route it took to get there, it was just kind of unamazing and conventional. But I didn't hate it. I just felt like I wasn't really in the mood to read the rest of the series, so that's why it's at number eight. 
And taking the number seven spot, we have Reign of Shadows by Sophie Jordan. I enjoyed Luna and Fowler. I felt that Luna was the best one, though. This is the first time I've ever read about a blind character. And, well, actually read from the point of view of a blind one. And the cover is just gorgeous. It promises an adventure through some sort of forest where everything is odd and probably deadly, but beautiful. And the book doesn't disappoint on that note. And Fowler was okay, too. I was glad he was as cynical as he was. I really like to read about characters that need some convincing to do the right thing. They make it so they feel less plain than the typical hero. I guess if you ask me, the reason that it's on this list, apart from the fact there were very few clunkers that I had read this year, was that the world building didn't really work for me. I can't remember, come to think of it, the names of any of the gangs or soldiers that were traversing. Also, I got the impression that this was supposed to be a book that was all about hiking, but to me, it seemed more romance-focused. I found it forgettable. Now taking the number six spot is a book called Love, Hate, and Other Filters by Samira Ahmed. And I really didn't think this would be on it, especially since the cover reminded me a lot of The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. But after I read it and put it down and looked at the cover again, it almost felt like the author was really aiming for it to be another The Hate You Give, but there were just so many shortcomings. It was, it was so aggravating. It's supposed to be about the discrimination of a Muslim teen after this terrorist attack, but for starters, it takes way too long to get there, and it has next to nothing to do with the main character herself, this attack, other than the fact that she's Muslim, and one other very slim detail that ends up um, glossed over later on. But, like, once, as, once it happens, like, the school ends up on lockdown, but their teacher says, let's still watch the film. I mean, that was very silly. I'll admit that there is some okay um, food descriptions in here, and some nice anger as well, and... I'll even go as far as to say that um, that this very racist teenager named Brian is very ferocious, but there's a big climax where Brian ends up confronting Maya, and there's supposed to be a big revelation about how all of a sudden everything's going to be good for her, but she, I don't think that Ahmed took the time to really think of a good way to surprise the audience well enough. I wasn't fooled. And the romance between Maya and her interest, Phil, and also um, the other Muslim kid, Kareem, that was okay. It's just that a few years back, I read The Sin Eater's Daughter by Melinda Salisbury, and I hated that book, but by the end of the last chapter, I felt like, okay, there's, there's more that could be explored. Maybe this is just a slow start. But then the epilogue dived into some months that had passed, and I was no longer interested at all. This epilogue is one of the worst I've read in years. It undoes so much of what it had going for it, and that's why it's up to number six on my list. I mean, I'm sorry, everyone. Just, if, if, you, know, if you want to know, um, there's another um, Muslim-oriented book called American Heart by Laura Moriarty that's on my top ten best list. If you ask me that... That's a, that's a terrific depiction of Muslim families, even though the author is American completely, and I'm gonna shut up and go to the next book. And taking the number five spot is the end of a trilogy. It's called War of the Cards by Colleen Oaks, or the first one was Queen of Hearts, which I gave a three and a half out of four to, then Blood of Wonderland, which I gave a two and a half out of four to, and the funny thing was, after I finished War of the Cards, it was originally twice the grade I give it now. It was originally a 3 out of 4, but the more I thought about it, the more I just hated it. it in, in all honesty, I feel like the title should have been called Battle of the Cards, or maybe just um, Epilogue of the Cards. I'll admit that this book ends up trying to do some different stuff. The final battle ends up for like just starting just a third into the book and ends up ending pretty quickly. And then we get to see um, the new queen, Dina, trying to pick um, some slack off for, and all the messes from, from the big battle. However, what it ended up turning into was the second half just ended up very boring as a result. It seemed completely unintentionally boring, too. And, and also, there was a big twist up between two of these characters, excluding Dina, 
and it felt like not only just such a missed opportunity, but an insult that didn't really make much sense. And as a result, I felt that this trilogy really ended on a bad note, which was very upsetting considering the first book in the trilogy really made me upset for Dina, and I cheered her on at her escape from her kingdom. And now taking the number four spot is an even more disappointing book to me, and that was Dream a Little Dream, the first in the Silver Trilogy by Kirsten Gere. Funny thing is, I read her debut novel, or I think it was a debut novel, but either way, Ruby Red um, several years back and loved it so much. Sapphire Blue then disappointed me on a major scale, and so did Emerald Green. Kirsten Gere wasn't really up to the task of creating a big thriller, that or... Her writing just ended up way too slow and very uneventful. It's sort of like Tahir and Mafi, where she ends up going into details about romance or what other people are thinking about, and while there's supposed to be a battle brewing, but she saves it all till the very last few pages, and it's almost like Kirsten Gere and Tahir and Mafi are kind of phobic of big battles. And, and honestly, all of this stuff about dreams is certainly interesting. I'm a longtime Shark Boy and Lava Girl fan. However, this fantasy book was no fun. The love square wasn't completely agonizing, and if the book had started to keep up the pace a little bit by the 150 or 200 page mark, then maybe, just maybe, this would have had a recommendation. And I am okay with an author going into family dynamics while there is a big battle brewing. That is perfectly fine by me. I do that in my books all the time as well. I feel it's good to flesh out your characters no matter how minor they are. But there is such a thing as overly fleshing them out, as well as turning a blind eye to what people are more interested in. But coming in at number three is a book called The Only Outcast by Julie Johnston. It's actually based off of this diary that the author found based on that was written from this guy named Fred Dickinson who always who always stuttered. Um, however, I'd say that out of all the books on this list, this one is sadly the most forgettable. It's basically just about this wimp. Or well, I, I know that I sound like a bully calling him a wimp. That's just like that's just the impression I got of him. I'm sorry. Um, don't think that I would ever just call someone a wimp out of the blue. I, all of a sudden, I feel dirty. But here's the deal. I guess it's it's basically just um, a rewrite of this apparent diary of this one week trip down at this cottage, and I'm sure that the diary must have been interesting in that proper moment. It's just that to me. It felt like a very uninspired book. It felt like um, it felt like the author was writing it just because she found a 90-year-old diary. It didn't. This didn't feel like a very personal tale. It tries to put in a romance aspect, and it's pretty unremarkable. As are the rest of the characters. In fact, I'm sorry, but um, about an hour after finishing this book, I even forgot that the main character's last name was Dickinson. The only thing I think it had going for it was its attempt to kind of be different, and also for Fred's dad forcing him to, apparently in the future, go to this factory in Toronto that makes robes, something he didn't want to do, but at the time, I'm sure it must have been very hard to find a job, so maybe you should have thought of it further, but uh, anyway, let's keep going. Now taking the number two spot is a book called Juliet Immortal by Stacey J. I had this on my TBR for like two years ever since I learned about it, and here's why. Romeo and Juliet is my favorite Shakespeare play. I haven't read many Shakespeare plays, just four of them including that one, and they were all for my four English classes in high school, but, but yeah, Romeo and Juliet was the one I was most curious about kind of throughout my youth, and it was definitely an interesting story that I really thought about. But a lot of people kind of say that it was kind of insta-lovey. And I can't disagree, not at all. So the idea that they're making a kind of a sequel to Romeo and Juliet with um, kind of poking fun at that, I thought that was a terrific idea for a YA book. However, in trying to be a parody of itself, it also ends up copying so much stuff from the original Shakespeare play that a lot of people have been criticizing. 
I will admit, something that's good about it is when Juliet ends up in this other girl's body, she manages to give this girl's mom more love than the original, and that made me feel happy for the two of them while it lasted. However, it ends up going for even more typical romance, and, and Juliet actually ends up, I know I just called Fred this, but wimpy in the case that there was really not much she actually ended up doing. Um, she usually didn't end up running away when she could, and often just thought of how Romeo's voice was dreamy even when he was saying something very threatening, and I thought to myself, hold on a minute, this is very romance-obsessed. If I was running away from a psychopath, I wouldn't be thinking about how his voice is beautiful. I would think that even if he was playing a harp, that that sound of that harp would be just terrifying. It might just might make me faint. This novel was all over the place and couldn't find any proper footing, and that as a result, it ended up just tedious. And tedious was something I really didn't want a book based on my favorite Shakespeare play to end up in. But yeah, it was. But there's one other book that, well, that triumphed over all of them. And actually, for a fair amount of it, I thought it wouldn't be. But at the end of it, I had to decide I wasn't kidding myself. Now, last year, there were two F books, two zero star books that I put on. And they were Fallen and The Infinite Sea. And I'm sorry to say that one of them is the sequel to that one. No, it's not The Last Star, the sequel to The Infinite Sea. That one was actually good. I'd say it was my most surprising read of 2018. So that leaves the sequel to Fallen by Lauren Kate, Torment. Just, I know that, that the Fallen series is pre Fifty Shades of Grey, but it just seems like, it seems like they belong in the same sentence because both of the, main, of the main characters have ridiculous thoughts that go on in their mind. In fact, let me count some of the ways that this book ended up just making me slap my head. Daniel, Luce's love interest, and apparently her soulmate, he says that he has to go away for the war for a few weeks, and Luce just says, a few weeks in horror. But, I mean, I've been in relationships that uh, where I've had to say goodbye for months on months, and... So a few weeks is really not that bad. And and then later on, when Luz starts to develop feelings for another guy, she then later on, even though Daniel saw her with another boy outright and was clearly very troubled and angry, she then said to someone very important to her, oh, me and Daniel uh, were in love. I think you better double check with him on that. And he Daniel just ends up going back to the same way he was in the original book, just keeping Luz in suspense, keeping secrets from her, that's why it's called Torment. And also, um, there's even a moment when Luce tries to step out and her ex-love interest named Camhee pushes her to the ground when she when they're being shot at and Luce then says, get off of me. I mean, they're being shot at. I would never say get off of me no matter how much I despise someone. They would have saved my life, thank you very much. This isn't as bad as Fallen, at least it goes to certain places. And I enjoyed Shelby and Miles quite a bit, especially Miles. And also, there's this one scene where Luce ends up going to parents that uh, she never knew she had because they were in a previous life, and she feels she can't barge in on them because they would freak out, and, and so she left them and she ended up crying as a result of that. That did make me think a lot. So, I mean, Torment is not completely bad. It's not as bad as Fallen, which just saved Aiden in the one school for the whole time and with just an abusive Daniel. And I'm glad that Daniel is away for a lot of this one. When he goes away and leaves loose at this new Shoreline school, I thought, we'll get a break from him. Maybe this will actually be good. But no, he keeps on popping up and up. Uh, it seems Lauren Kate can't write without the two of them together for at least, for at most 80 pages. By the end of the book, all of the times where Daniel just kept driving the whole thing down, it ended up driving Torment straight to my number one worst of 2018. Now, am I going to read the rest of the series? Well, I don't know. I mean, I read the sequel to Half Bad, which I hate, which I really didn't like. I read the sequel to The Infinite Sea, which I, where I hated it, but ended up loving The Last Star. I tried the same thing for Fallen, ended up hating it actually this time. 
So, I mean, you can't help but be a little curious about it. Hmm. Who knows? But anyway, yeah. Those are my 10 worst of 2018. And, well, just... I'm very happy that I got to share it with you uh, once again. I really like doing these top 10 lists. They really helped me feel like I read all of these books and it was a big accomplishment to be able to share this list with you. Thanks once again for watching and hope you enjoyed my video and have a good night or have a good day wherever you are or whatever time it is.